Hi, I'm Lee Baker, and welcome to this week's episode of Level Up with Lee. You know, we've been fighting through this pandemic for two years now, and sooner or later, we all experience grief. Many of us know someone who's been affected one way or the other by grief. And today's guest is someone who is an expert in the area of grief. So please welcome to our show, Jenny Lee Schmidt. Jenny, welcome. Hi, Lee. Great to be here. Thanks. Great to be here. So, Jenny, you know, I won't bore everybody with reading a long, you know, dissertation about how great you are and that sort of thing. But if you would just take a minute and and tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Yeah, happy to. Thank you. So uh, my background is actually that I had a full career as a management consultant for many years, and I did everything from working to the global Uh, professional services firms to some small boutique firms and for much of my career working for myself. But um, I experienced a really significant loss when I was not yet 50 years old and it really threw me for a loop. And once I found the solution for that, I decided to make that really my career. Um, Helping people with grief and through end of life was already kind of a personal passion. And I just decided this is a service that the world needs and one that I'm equipped to offer. And I got really passionate about Again, building it as my business as well as bringing it to everyone. And I want to make one slight, um, I want to share a slight nuance, Lee. I sure. actually consider myself uh, an expert in grief. I'm not a, a counselor or have that kind of training, but I am an expert in grief recovery, which I think is the more important part of the equation. My mission is to help people know there is something they can do if they're struggling with grief, know how to find the right resources, because I think. Um, you know, what I wish for people is that they they get over those challenges so that they can get back to enjoying their life and making the most of the time they have. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And, and, and that, while it may seem like a small nuance, that's huge because what it is that we all need to do is, is move beyond it, however it is that we can continue on. So thank you for that. Thank so you. being on topic, if you will, what are some of the different types of loss or grief that we all deal with? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because a really important thing for people to understand is that literally any change in life can cause grief. And most people don't think of it that way, right? Like we think, most people think of death as the only thing that causes grief and maybe divorce because divorce is like the death of a relationship. But the truth is any life event can cause grief. Now, We won't all experience grief every time we go through a change in life or an ending or a loss. Different people will be struck by different losses, right? Being more or less significant to them. But it's important to know that any, uh, any life event or life change has the potential to cause grief, including things that we would normally think of that are happy occasions, like getting married, having a baby, retiring, changing Mm. jobs. So um, it's just good to be aware that we're all, experiencing grief maybe more than we give ourselves credit for to have some perspective that we've um we may have been through a lot and we may be carrying around some baggage from some of those things that we may never recognized as having grief interesting interesting you know you mentioned you know divorce being sort of like a death if you will you know in society at least in, in, in my era growing up, you know, as a guy, I'm supposed to be tough and be able to handle everything. Do men and women experience grief differently? And do we recover differently from, from loss or grief? Yeah, that is a wonderful question. And I'm really glad you used the word experience. I was having a conversation with some of my colleagues the other day, and we decided together that a great way to describe it is that grief is not a process. Grief is an experience, meaning every individual experiences grief differently than every other individual. So I don't believe one's gender has anything to do with how they experience grief the same or differently because each individual, no matter race, color, creed, gender, anything, will experience grief differently. And each individual will experience grief differently at different points in their life. So for instance, if I had two divorces, I'm gonna have two very unique and distinct grief experiences over those two losses, even though they're kind of the same kind. So that's the the overlying um, answer in terms of how everyone experiences grief. What I think might be different between men and women, at least in America, goes back to what you said, Lee. I think there's, um, 
maybe a societal pressure to, for men to be tough and, and as an extension of that, to not get help when they're feeling negative emotions or challenging emotions like grief. And so I think women may be more quick to go find some support that they need. Not all women, but many women. I think women are more likely to go to the, the regular physical doctor, right? They're more likely oh, to yeah. go to a counselor. So um, women seem to have slightly more access to services for grief. But again, one of my missions is to let people know that there are some amazing um, protocols you can use to help you with grief. Uh, and it may, may or may not be with your regular counselor or therapist. So for instance, I'm an advanced certified grief recovery method specialist. Uh, I'm certified by the Grief Recovery Institute and we have a very particular protocol that in all of my experience as both a practitioner and a patient of mental wellness services, to me, it's what I found to be most effective. So I just love making people aware that that something like that exists and can be a really great solution for them. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good deal. So, you know, we go through these experiences and we're experiencing them differently, but you know, do we learn some things going through these experiences? Yes, I think we can learn positive things and negative things. So I think the nature of your question was kind of like, what kind of gifts or important life lessons does grief bring us? And, and I think there are a lot. It's hard to tell that to a person who's suffering with grief because it's such an un pleasant experience. Right. But the truth is you do learn things. Like if you lost a loved one, you might learn that time is short and you either need to get on with what you're wanting to do with your life, or you need to um, share more clearly with the people that you love. Right. So, so I think those are really important things. Um, but another thing that can happen is that when you experience grief, you might learn or be reinforced um, a few myths about grief and how to deal with grief. And those can be negative because those myths are teaching us all how to deal with grief, but they're teaching us very ineffective ways. And they, it's easy to perpetuate them from one generation okay. to another, right? Because we do what our parents taught us and then our kids do what we, what we taught them. So that's a potential danger. Sure. So um, thank you for opening it up. You know, this is level up with Lee and, and all things money. But when you talk about different myths, if, if you don't mind sharing with our viewers, what are some of these myths and do they do you see them having impacts on the financial lives of your clients and the, and the people that you work with through grief recovery? Yes, I can think of two of the myths. We say there are six of them, but there are two that I think especially relate to the financial realm. Number one is, Lee, have you ever heard or given the advice, don't make any major financial decisions for at least one year after a loss? That's pretty common. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that, that I think is really rooted in the myth that time heals all wounds. So we are sort of brought up to believe that if we can just endure how we feel for some mysterious length of time, that time is going to be a magic elixir that will automatically heal our broken hearts. And that's not really the case. It really takes action. Again, pursuing some kind of healing, ideally with an expert, but possibly on your own, um, in order to resolve grief. And so I want to call out that the one year is not really a magical uh, milestone. So people who have pursued some healing for their grief ahead of time, they might be ready well before one year. Someone sure. who's never pursued any actual healing for their grief might not be ready to make those decisions for a long time afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're absolutely correct. And when you ask the question, have I ever given anyone that sort of advice? More or less, the answer to that question is yes. You know, some of the things that we try to get clients to do is understand uh, if there has been this major change, you know, again, maybe it's retirement. Sometimes it, it's winning the lottery. There's been a legal settlement. Uh, we've had clients uh, feel emotionally bad about having these resources. And so it can be a difficult thing that this, this suit was settled and I, I'm sitting here with a lot of money, but exhibit really negative behaviors because internally it's almost as though this money has become bad. And, you know, there's some things you have to do if someone passes away and, you know, there's life insurance proceeds. Well, you got to pay certain bills, but, uh, you know, give yourself the time to, as you say, heal, you know, give yourself the time to just be, it's okay to just be, and don't feel like just because 
in the case of some of those things, life insurance or uh, legal settlement or lottery or whatever, don't feel like you have to do something just because it's sitting there. Allow, allow yourself to go through it or experience it, if you will. So, so thank you. Um, now, you mentioned two things, really, kind of two out of six that apply to finances. What's, what's that second thing that, that applies to the financial realm? Yeah, the second one is uh, a myth that teaches us to replace the loss. And when you said life insurance or inheritance or legal settlement, that really came up for me. Because number one, um, well, let me give you some statements that kind of go along with that myth. Like if you've ever had a child lose a dog, you might tell the child, don't worry, we'll get a new puppy next weekend. Or if you ever had a breakup, you might have a loved one say to you, don't worry, there's more fish in the sea. You'll find another girlfriend by prom, right? So these are all things that perpetuate that myth that the way to heal our hearts is to replace the loss. Now, I can tell you from my experience, um, sometimes we don't try to replace it with exactly what we lost, like the puppy or the loved one. It's sure. easy to try to replace it with physical things, right, that we can spend money on. So for instance, in my experience, my tragic loss was the death of my grandmother. And I ended up using some of the cash that she left to me to go buy a new car. And part that car was part of what I call Academy Award recovery, me trying to convince the world and more importantly, convince myself that everything was okay, right? So right. It was kind of a way to distract myself, kind of a way to soothe myself. But Lee, if you had had your hands on me, you would not have let me spend, you know, that chunk of cash on a, on a, a, a car that uh, deteriorates, right? You would have had me yeah. put it in a much better financial decision. So that's a good, a really tangible example, I think, about how, um, these things can impact how we manage our finances when we're grieving. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that, that's interesting. And, and we, we've had a fair share of stories where, um, you know, people have gone out and, and made purchases that were unwise. Sometimes we've been able to, to talk people out of it, but other times haven't been able to talk people out of it. And, you know, it seems almost invariably as though we came back later on and said, you know, when you told me not to buy that Hummer, yeah. if you will, probably should have listened to you. It's like, yeah, maybe not. Um, we also experienced it, you know, candidly in times like now. So as we're recording this, we're still in the midst of uh, the whole Russia-Ukrainian situation and uh, some people's account values have gone down. And, and so uh, I've, I've had a number of phone conversations where somebody's like, oh, you know, I kind of wish I hadn't looked at my account statement. It's temporary. And, and so they're experiencing grief of their balances sure. a little lower this month than, than last month. But uh, absolutely, it, it, it happens and we transition through those things. Um, do you see people, you know, I guess maybe taking their grief to work with them? You know, is it impacting them in their jobs and in their work lives as well? Yes, definitely. So first of all, I think we can all agree on that if, just by common sense, right? Like if we're spending most of our five days out of seven days at work, if we're grieving, it stands to reason that we're bringing that grief to work, right? But I also have some statistics to, to share with you about this. And this is from an organization called Lantern that is a, a very cool startup organization that's trying to bring grief and end-of-life support services at scale to, to companies um, nationwide, maybe worldwide, so that large employers can help their um, employees deal with grief. So these are some statistics that they have. And I'm looking down to read my numbers and get them right. Sure. Seven percent of Americans are grieving a recent loss. You know, frankly, these are probably pre-pandemic numbers, right? Because I find it hard to believe that more people are it's probably more than 57 percent, if I had to guess. Right. 88 percent are experiencing emotional emotional symptoms of grief and 68 percent are experiencing physical symptoms of grief. So what people may not understand is that in addition to how we feel emotionally, whether that's sad, guilty, bereft, maybe some positive emotions too, like relieved. Um, 
we're feeling those things emotionally, but it's also impacting our mental capacity and our physical capacity. So when people are grieving, they can't pay as close attention as they used to. They can't focus for as long as they used to. They don't have as much physical energy to sustain them through the day. Plus they may have changed habits like sleeping too little or eating too much or drinking too much. So there's a lot of ways we're being impacted and we are bringing all of that to work. So um, that's, that's one of the things that I feel really passionate about spreading the word, both to those of us who are individuals dealing with grief, because there's an opportunity to maybe be more authentic with your uh, employer, see if there's a way you can have some accommodations that are not unreasonable, but are similar to how they might accommodate someone who has a broken ankle or a, or a pattern of chemotherapy to take care of. So uh, I, I'd love to empower grievers to uh, speak up for what they need for this period of time. And by the way, those grievers, I think, are also under an obligation to pursue healing, right? It's not just the employer's obligation to accommodate you for an indefinite amount of time, but also to help um, employers understand that this is showing up at work and it has the impact to impact to affect, you know, the people's team teaming ability, individual productivity and all that rolls up to the bottom line of the business. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You know, it, as you were talking, a thought occurred to me in terms of, you know, yeah, it was from the perspective of employee, employer. Uh, but one of the, the primary team dynamics that people have is, you know, husband, wife, uh, you know, parent, child. What do some of those dynamics look like uh, in the quote unquote family environment? Are there some things that, you know, as a husband, uh, I, I should do, how do I help my wife uh, if maybe she's grieving and vice versa? If, if I've got a scenario, you know, where uh, literally within the last three weeks, I've had a couple of family members pass away and, um, you know, you, you try to navigate those things. So if we're, we're in the family environment, uh, husband, wife, brother, sister, that kind of thing, are there some things that, that people can do to help be supportive as their loved one is experiencing grief perhaps a little differently than, than mm. other times. I love that. And, and, you know, I want to, so first of all, I'm sorry for the losses your family has experienced. Um, so you. you're, you're an example of what we were saying about so many different things are hitting so many of us so often in these recent years, but I'm so sorry right. about that. And, and I actually want to start with a story because my big grief event, as you know, I said, it, it hit me. I was like about 47 when my grandmother passed away. Um, that really, had the potential to impact my marriage. In fact, my husband and I ended up getting separated not too long after that. And, and we almost divorced. We did not. We're, we're reconciled and we passed 15 years this year. But, um, but that, so I know clearly how it can impact both business, because I was also an entrepreneur at the time. It's kind of hard to build your business when you don't feel like getting out of bed, but also a, as part of a partnership. So a number of things. Um, first of all, I would say, again, it's, uh, I think it's incumbent upon the griever to acknowledge that they're going through something difficult and it's impacting how they're thinking and behaving and be able to say, yes, you know, there are a few different things I need for support or I need time or I need space, whatever they need. Um, because again, that that's a way that you can start having more frank conversations like, hey, I'm really in pain. I tend to turn towards alcohol or I tend to go shopping too much when I'm in pain, right? And not keep it so secret secret and get your financial, uh, excuse me, get your partner in on some of the financial decisions and impacts that you might be able, uh, you might be tempted to take. Um, right. As far as what the partner can do, I think again, the biggest, two big things I would say is number one, be aware how differently everyone grieves. So if the way your partner is grieving doesn't match with how you think you would handle a situation, just have some grace for the fact that everyone's really different and there's no check boxes, there's no stages, there's no order that people go in. So try to ride that roller coaster with them as one of my coach mentors uh, taught me. Um, secondly, to be honest, the best place to start is also the easiest. You know, it can be very scary to figure out what should I say to, to a person or what can I do for a person? The beautiful thing is what a griever wants most is just someone to listen. So particularly as a spouse, it's time to brush off those listening skills and just sit there. And I'll give you a word picture to describe what kind of a listener is best for a griever. It is a heart with ears and tape over its mouth. So you want to definitely demonstrate non-verbally that you're listening. But um, when a griever is expressing how they feel or what they think they might need. So first of all, let them just 
process externally. Not everything they say may come to fruition or make sense, but let them have a chance to sort of get it out of their head. And number two, this is not a time for judgment, comparison, advice. And to be honest, Lee, that's what can make it hard for partners to have these kind of conversations because a partner has their own experience of whatever the loss was, right? So a, a, a husband might jump in and say, that's not what I thought about your mother-in-law or, or a wife might jump in and say, well, this isn't that big of a deal, right? So it's really hard to keep that tape over our mouths and just let the griever express what they want to express without trying to jump in and be part of that story. But the precious minutes you can give them where they get to say exactly what they want to say, exactly the way they want to say it can be a real elixir for part of their healing. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, So we're experiencing the grief one way or another. What can, what can we do about it? What are some things that you might suggest to our viewers that they can do. Um, you know, you talk about, you know, hey, for some people, maybe that is going and getting retail therapy or, or, or what have you. But what are what are some of the things you think I, viewers can do? Yeah, well, I want to make a distinction between short term things you can do and long term things you can do. Okay. So we actually have a word for the short term things. We in Grief Recovery Institute, we call them short term energy relieving behaviors. STURBS is our shorthand for that. So nobody has to remember that. But a STURB is whatever you're doing to distract yourself from your grief, to do a little self self soothing. Um, Those things fall under STURBS. And we've already mentioned some of them food, alcohol, sex, shopping, gambling. Um, There might be other things that are generally positive that you're using too, like reading or television. Um, Then there might be things like isolation or anger. Like, can you see how all of those are just helping you let a little pressure out of the pressure cooker? Absolutely. Um, So, and I'm not casting any judgment on those, but the reminder is to use those in a healthy way. Um, It's okay to want to be soothed short-term. It's okay to want to distract yourself short-term, but don't let that be your only crutch. Because as you can imagine, I have a belief that those things, if a person starts turning to those things in grief, that could be the root cause of an addiction. If they happen to have an addictive personality, right? If someone's only tool to medicate is food or alcohol or one of those other things, it's easy to see how that could blow up into a an unintended consequence. And again, that circles back to finances too, right? Like let's say you get into an addiction and you're spending all your money on the cigarettes or the drugs or the alcohol, right? Or or other financial problems. So you can see how it's really interwoven into a lot of part of our lives. So that's that's the short term. Don't judge yourself, but keep your eyes open and use them uh, judiciously. What, what I think is most important, again, is finding that long-term healing. What you're experiencing is a broken heart. So just like you would take your broken ankle or your broken arm to the doctor, let's take your broken heart to someone who knows how to fix that. Again, I really advocate the grief recovery method. And um, if people want to find out more about that, they can go to griefrecoverymethod.com. And there you can search for uh, providers all across the country, some of whom are um, authorized to do this work via Zoom, like I am. Those are the advanced specialists. Others do this work in person if you prefer to work one-on-one or or often in groups in your locality. So check that out. Um, There are, of course, other, there are other options, like you could go to a therapist or a counselor, but again, I would recommend looking for someone who's a specialist in grief. Um, And thirdly, I would just like to say something about support groups. There are many support groups and there are many faith-based support groups. And obviously I haven't been to all of them. So uh, I'm making kind of a general critique, but I would like to make people aware that sometimes if you're in the kind of support group where you're just telling your story over and over and over again, I would just like to point out that that really doesn't bring healing. What that does is that kind of solidifies that story as part of your identity. And that can have the effect of making it a little harder to give up should you decide you want to heal, right? So if you're a person whose uh, outlook is on the future and you want healing, that may not be the best route for you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I've noticed a couple things. So we, we did see a little tail wagging there, but I can't take my eyes off of the map behind you. So what's your favorite place to visit? And do you take your your furry mate with you on some of those uh, trips when you go? 
That's a good question. I tell you, for the last decade or so, my favorite place in the U.S. to visit is Siesta Key, Florida. And ah. I, feel, I feel like I shouldn't say that out loud because it's a little bit of a hidden gem, although it does get rated as the number one beach in America quite a lot. It has beautiful white, like really soft white sand and great uh, ocean water and stuff, Gulf water, excuse me. Um, but anyway, so that's one of my favorites. I have never had a chance to bring my furry friend. Her name is Ginger. But uh, it, during the pandemic, I did have a chance to bring my spouse down for the first time. Usually my sister and I go for our annual okay. sister trip, but she couldn't make it during the pandemic. So my husband got introduced to Siesta Key and now he loves it too. So now I go twice a year. There you go. Great. There you go. Way to double up. Absolutely. Now, Jenny, thank you. This has been great. But before we go, would you please let our viewers know how they can get in contact with you? Yes, thank you, Lee. I appreciate that. So my uh, my name is Ginny Lee Schmid, and uh, I can be found on LinkedIn at that with that name. And also my company name is Change Navigators LLC. And so you can probably the easiest thing to do is to go to my website, changenavigatorsllc.com. I actually um, on the website have an opportunity for you to book a call if you would like, or to download a free Freedom to Thrive workbook that can help you assess where you are and whether you might be interested in these kind of services. And I'd love to keep in touch with anyone who'd like to find me there. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that, Jenny. And remember, that's Jenny with a J. So Jenny, you know, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you for coming on the show with us today. Uh, listen, for any of our viewers out there that are, are wondering or struggling, again, as Jenny mentioned, please go to griefrecoverymethod.com and, and look for someone near you that can help. Uh, until next time, uh, be well and remember, level up with Lee.